don't block the, the path of inquiry. Don't lay down rules that make it impossible for people to ask important questions. Welcome to the Thought Stretchers podcast, where we hope to stretch your thinking about important issues in education through rich inquiry. My name is Drew Perkins, and I'm your host for these conversations for complexity and nuance. In this episode, I spoke with Randy Wayne. Randy is a professor at Cornell University, and my first encounter with him was through a piece that was published on the Substack for Coddling of the American Mind movie, which is certainly worth a watch. If you haven't, you can go to coddlingmovie.com, and we talk about that a little bit. His piece is titled, and this is from June 20th, Equity Undermines Science Education, Here's a Better Option. In that piece, he argues that the next generation science standards are undermining good science education. And because of that, the students that are coming to him at Cornell in his science classes are lacking in content knowledge. And so they advocate for something called the Franklin Standards, which was developed by the National Association of Scholars. One of the things that I pushed back on Randy originally about was his claim that the next generation science standards was overly emphasizing inquiry and so we went back and forth a little bit about that in that Substack article comments and I asked him to come on the podcast and we had a good conversation about that. You'll hear that he and I actually agree about that and we talk about what that knowledge rich inquiry teaching should look like and we talk about the Franklin standards and how science education and the next generation science standards in his estimation is not doing a good job or not helping teachers do a good job in producing good science students and science thinkers. I hope to have some K-12 teachers who were involved in the development of the Franklin Standards on the podcast in the future. For more on our knowledge-rich inquiry teaching and other professional development and learning options, I always recommend you go to our website, which is wegrowteachers.com. There you can find all of our professional development workshops, our blogs, this podcast. And if you want to reach out to me, you can do so by emailing me directly at drew at thoughtstretchers.org. And now I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Randy Wayne. I am with Randy Wayne, who is a professor at Cornell, but he's going to give us a much better introduction, talk about his background and who he is. We're going to talk about science and next generation science standards and a new set of standards that he and some others are advocating for called the Franklin Standards. But welcome, Randy. I want to give you that opportunity to say hello and introduce yourself, give a little background so folks know who they are listening to. Thank you, Drew, and thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Randy Wayne. I'm associate professor at Cornell University. I'm a biophysical plant cell biologist. And for a long time, I worked on how cells sensed light and gravity. And then biology got rid of the logos part of biology and became genomics or other kind of omics. And I became less interested in that kind of biology. So I went directly into studying what is light and what is gravity, which is what I do now. Um, I was the project director on the Franklin Standards, which are the um, uh, new K through 12 science standards. And they're beautiful, if I don't say so myself. They're really (laughs) beautiful. And uh, I was so excited to hear about the Franklin Standards project because my students at Cornell, who should be the creme de la creme, are not that good anymore. They just don't have the background that students used to uh, approximately 10 years ago. So I have to teach much less than I used to. And um, and I actually have to teach a lot of just basics. I wrote a paper um, called Science and Soros, Critical Versus Manipulative Thinking and I gave it to my department chair at the time. And he read it and said, you know, what the what this paper says is that people don't know how to question anymore is true of our stu- students. So not a- only are they low in content knowledge, but they lost the ability to question. And the Franklin standards really remedy those two things. 
Gotcha. Well, that's a good starting point. Uh, so sometimes I think it can be helpful if you don't mind sharing what was your academic journey, even going back to K-12, like what was your schooling like in terms of uh, what you can recall pedagogy and approach? You know, we talk a lot about, you know, you mentioned inquiry. We really rely or, or advocate strongly for inquiry, but also we actually talk about knowledge-rich inquiry now because we want to make sure that people understand that there is a real importance for content knowledge and that that sort of false dichotomy of sort of director explicit instruction versus inquiry. So I'm curious, just in that context, what was your schooling like and your journey to, uh, to, to your professional life? So um, I went to the Newton School System. I went through the Newton School System just outside of Boston, and they were famous for their school system, and it was great. And I remember in um, first grade, we took a field trip into the woods near our school. And the teacher told us that the moss grew on the north side of the tree. But the moss grew all around the tree. And um, something just seemed wrong. And I, I don't think, I don't remember if I spoke up then, but I've remembered that to this day. <laughs> and uh, I love nature. Um, school um, brought us into nature we had um in sixth grade there was one week we went to a nature retreat that was a big deal my parents had always taken us hiking and uh, looking at plants and animals and um so i love school um it, elementary school was k through six and um love being with my friends love playing in the playground um liked learning poetry i remember walter de la mere we must go i must go back to the sea again from miss finnegan in second grade <laughs> um, our, in third grade we were at a um an assembly and the principal dr eldridge walked in and said our president has been shot hmm. still remember that moment uh, fourth grade, maybe the most memorable thing is we had a mock election with um, um, Johnson and, um, geez, that's, um, I think, it, I think maybe Johnson hadn't resigned yet. Maybe it was Humphrey and Nixon. Um, <laughs> and I guess I don't remember very well. In fifth grade, I remember talking about the Vietnam War, and that was a particularly um, big thing. Sixth grade, um, I was in a special math class, and in the regular class, my regular teacher, Miss Quinn, um, we had art, and I remember I painted the monkey's guitar <laughs> as my art project, and she pulled me over and said, you're much better than this. I actually am not a very good artist. I'm not much better than this. But um, it was the first, time, first and only time I ever cried in school. In seventh, eighth, and ninth junior high school, um, we got to pick our own classes and we had no grades. It was uh, Meadowbrook Junior High School, it was an experimental high school, but it was part of the school system. And it was wonderful. They, they mixed together social studies and English. Um, love science, love doing experiments. And um, I remember Miss Wolf took our seventh grade class to Boston Common to see George Wallace speak. Not because anybody was for George Wallace, but because a um, presidential candidate was coming nearby. So um, those were the days you could just see somebody to get educated instead of being identified with them. Mm. Um, and uh, my homeroom teacher was Mr. Brunke, and he taught chemistry. And um, we did all these experiments and saw colors change when you added acid and base, and it was just amazing. And it was like, what's happening? It looked like magic, but then they tell us that it wasn't magic. <laughs> it was uh, something called pH that affected the um, colors of cabbage and um in junior high school and high school too i also took shop class took electronics every single year 
loved electronics, loved learning how parts worked and to build my own equipment, built my own stereo. That was a big deal mm. in fifth grade. And um, in high school, um, I took biology, Miss Sullivan, chemistry, Marcel Feinberger, um, uh, physics with Mr. Geddes, and advanced placement ecology with Miss Bashard. And I remember in chemistry, we were learning the gas laws. Um, and it was so abstract and so difficult. I kept um, going to the teacher and saying, can we do some experiments? Because I'm just not getting this. And um, he said, just trust me. You'll get it. You'll get it. And um, I wasn't getting it. I really wasn't getting it at all. And um, we had a neighbor that was on the school committee. So I walked down the street and asked him if he'd look into it. And we started having uh, labs right away, which made it a lot more easy to understand. And um, so I, I would say I had a very good, very good schooling in the core sciences, which I ended up being a scientist, um, civics and social studies, English, um, and the curiosity wasn't kicked out of me. <laughs> and then you matriculated to university, I'm assuming. And where did you go? Just a quick oh, overview there. Oh, oh, yeah. This is kind of an interesting story. I, um, my father was a photographer, and I wanted to go to the Rochester Institute of Technology um, to, to be a photographer. My father said, "Don't be a photographer. Go into something that will make more money." Mm. But um, I didn't. Uh, so. so um, Rochester Institute of Technology wrote back and said, didn't you know the applications were due two months ago? <laughs> and I didn't because I wasn't serious about going to college. Although I also applied to UMass at the same time because um, it was just free to apply and I just did. Then my friend Rick and I took the Greyhound Amira Pass cross country for three months and um, started out in... Uh, New York City, and we stayed with Rick's cousin, who since has become a very famous artist, Jonathan Borofsky, and he took us through Soho and all the different art galleries and told us what kinetic art was and what the artists were trying to get through. And um, then from there, we went down to the coal mining regions of Virginia and nearby Kentucky, and um, Greyhound lost our packs. So for two weeks, we couldn't move. But a guy named Eric Reese took us in and said, you can stay with me until your um, packs come. And he introduced us to lots of artists and musicians. So my first Doc Watson concert. And, um, and um, met a moonshiner. And <laughs> being, I still remember, he sold, I think moonshine was $12 a gallon and fox urine was 20 and something seemed wrong about that but <laughs> um, we, we traveled all over the country we went um really all over the country and we had to come back after three months because rick was going to go to college to goddard college and i said to my mother you know i think i might like to go to college i don't want to graduate or anything but i think i might want to go and she said, I knew you'd change your mind. I already paid your tuition. <laughs> and that week, I went up there, and I haven't left college since. So I got my undergrad. Um, I ha Originally, I had no major. And um, I was sort of put in something called global, global studies, which was a mixture of science and sociology and politics and policy. And I didn't like the fact that I didn't feel like I knew enough science to argue policy. Hmm. So I headed into the sciences and I always had loved nature. And, um, and then I, I, I took a physiology course that I just loved human physiology. And I looked for another physiology course and it was plant physiology. I didn't even know plants had physiologies. <laughs> and um, it was taught by Bernie Rubenstein. It was a wonderful teacher. He started the class by saying, I hate teaching, but I have to. It's part of my job. Hmm. But anyhow, you'll probably like me. And and then he said, and I teach, I grade very subjectively. So I just want to tell you that. 
and um, he was a great teacher. He just he he everything was how do we know what we know? He went through the evidence and building up the arguments, and the reason he had a great subjectively, he'd give us test questions like, here's an observation. How do you think it can be explained? And sometimes, frankly, you had no clue. Um, sometimes you did. So maybe you'd get like a 38 on the test. Hmm. So we had a grade subjectively because maybe a 38 was an A or a B. And, um, but it really made you think and see the wonder of how plants work. And he had a huge influence on me. Another um, teacher, um, David Beerhorst, um, he wrote our textbook. He was a plant morphologist. He'd go to New Guinea with a shotgun and shot, shoot down fir epiphytic ferns from tall trees and <laughs> study them. And, and I just realized, oh, the science that I learned, that I like in books, are done by human beings. And this guy is an author. And I remember that was a big revelation to me. Um, I had a teacher, Jim Lockhart, uh, who was an incredibly quantitative thinker and an alcoholic. And in some respects, it was good that it was an alcoholic for me because it kind of slowed him down that I can just begin <laughs> to catch up with his thinking. But he taught me how to model and um, how to use math to understand biology. Mm. Um, I had a course on evolution taught by um, David Mulcahy. It was really interesting. At the end of the course, he told me he was a creationist. Mm. And I had no clue, absolutely no clue. And of course, I would have, if somebody asked me, is somebody a creationist, I would have thought they were toothless and dumb. But... Um, <laughs> Because, you know, the question had sort of never come up, but I realized that somebody really knew the evidence and really could teach it and be a creationist. Mm, yeah. Well, it's a, a fascinating journey, and you're at Cornell now, so you're teaching, you're teaching undergrads, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so we want to talk about the, the Franklin Standards and... Um, how you kind of came to you alluded to some of it a little bit earlier but if correct me if i'm wrong these were i guess spearheaded by is it the the lock uh john lock foundation or or what's the the name of the organization uh, uh um national association of scholars and freedom in education okay um i'm seeing it on johnlock.org maybe I, maybe it's on several places um so Tell us about that National Association of Scholars. What, what is that group's sort of genesis? Who's, who's it made up of? Um, and maybe the impetus behind that group coming to be, it, to the extent oh. that you know. Yeah, I can't answer the, the question. I, I can tell you um, how I, what I knew of it when I became involved. Scott Turner does a podcast called Restoring the Sciences. And he interviews mostly heterodox thinkers mm -hmm. about science. So um, the programs are very, very interesting. He's a very good interviewer, and um, you come away learning a lot. And the National Association of Scholars meant to me real scholars, real scholars, um, real in-depth in thinkers. And um, in fact, that it's national, it's it's really a very um, American group. Um, they have no, um, they're not ashamed of being Americans. They're very happy to be Americans, and um, and to work to make America a better place. Yeah. At, you know, at the same time. And um, I had also watched some of the podcasts that David Randall had on programs on American history. So um, I had known that they really put out good work, very, very good work. And, um, and that's actually, I don't know how they were founded before that. Um, I think they're really here to support scholarship. Yeah, well, it looks like uh, just on their website here, 
just so listeners have some background, it looks like February 2020 maybe was when they started. Oh, sorry, it's backwards. Um, goes much, much further back. So 94, 93, I'm scrolling down. Nonprofit, um, nonpartisan, uh, at least uh, that's in the descri- description there. Um, so your, your advocacy and their advocacy uh, for the Franklin Standards, at least in, in our conversations you're, that you articulated before, you're seeing students, undergrad students, who are showing up to Cornell, which is certainly not a, a lower-tier university. So we should have, uh, at least ostensibly, pretty well-informed, educated uh, students who know at least some basics of science before getting to you, but you're not seeing that, right? So seeing that anymore, not seeing that I anymore. Used to, see that. Yeah. used to see that, right? When when did you start seeing that shift? If you can put a put a, a date on it or a range of dates, I, I'm going to say approximately ten years ago. Okay, and. Um, and it had nothing to do with DEI at the time. Mm-hmm. It was an ov- overall shift. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't quite sure what was causing it. Actually, um, when I saw the next generation standards, that was the best reason I have, I have seen that what, what caused it. Okay. And so give us an example of, of, if you can, off the top of your head, of what that, how that might manifest and what it might look like in a classroom. Okay. So um, things that I used to um, think my students came with. Mm-hmm. And actually, I sort of make an assumption that they come as a blank slate and they know nothing and remember nothing. I remember that horror when the teacher used to say, you remember this from last year. Mm -hmm. I don't remember anything. So um, I really build up uh, almost everything I teach from first principles right from the beginning. I teach a lot of history, how we know what we know. And um, so that takes a certain amount of time to do things that way, but you make it up on the end because the students really understand, everybody understands everything. Mm -hmm. But now I can't do that so quickly Hmm. because they just don't have the the bandwidth to um, have little places in their mind that they can put this information in. They have to sort of build that at the same time. Hmm. So um, so I do it slower. If I want to do it as complete, I can't cover as much on the other end. So I, I may teach probably 20, um, 75% of what I used to teach. And that's a big difference. I'm doing page proofs on the third edition of my cell biology book right now. Mm-hmm. And so to see like the whole semester in in about a month of reading each chapter, I'm thinking these people don't know any of these basic things that I'm talking. I I, um, I may be teaching fifty percent. Hmm. So <laughs> so how much of this is is breadth versus depth? As you're talking, I'm thinking about. You know, as a as a as a social studies teacher, K twelve, uh, one of the courses I taught was U.S. history, and I was supposed to get in high school from Reconstruction to present day, which was always incredibly difficult because there's, as you can imagine, imagine there's lots to cover, and it's a matter of how deep you want to go, right? Um, and then every year they added another year, which is always you know <laughs> sort of defeating, right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> but that's a, that's a sort of breadth. It, you know, question, and there's a depth piece to it, right? We can go through lots of things quickly, but science isn't linear like that. It certainly can be foundational, but it isn't dates, right? We're not talking about historical dates in, in a timeline. So is it, how much of it is breadth and depth? You're talking about teaching 75%. I'm just trying to get a sense of what you mean by that 75% or that 50%, it, it, how much of that is breadth or depth? Actually, both. Okay. Yeah. So, um, 
Actually, I'll bring in a little American history. So I teach a course called Light and Life for non-majors. And um, actually, all the lecture notes for that are online and uh, people can get. I give a lecture that Michael Faraday had given over a week. Michael Faraday, at Christmas time, gave lectures for kids. And the lecture is called The Chemical History of a Candle. And it's what happens when a candle burns. And um, I actually start out that lecture talking about Benjamin Franklin. Because Benjamin F Franklin's father was a chandler, a candle maker. And when Ben was, Ben only went to school for two years, which was typical back then. And I, he didn't want to be a candle maker. He hated the smell of the tallow. Um, smells like cheeseburger. Um, <laughs> Sounds good and, to me. And, yeah, I mean, it's, and, and a little bit, it's, I make tallow candles for my class. And I make them at school now because when I made them at my house, uh, the house just smelled like you're sitting in the middle of a cheeseburger for <laughs> for a day. It was it was tough. Uh, I mean, so a little bit smells really good, and too much is not so good. So um, one of the so the um, my students have to write conversations with um, di different scientists that I talk about, and one person wrote about Benjamin Franklin as President Benjamin Franklin. So of course. I didn't mention that he was like secretary of state or, you know, his positions, but mm -hmm. she just assumed he was president because she never learned that Benjamin Franklin wasn't president mm -hmm. or who the presidents were at that time. So, so that has to um, do, that's a, and actually she turned out to be a great student. Um, she totally opened up when I talked about the Holocaust. And she just had, when I was talking about genetics and, and eugenics, mm. she just had no clue that that had ever happened. The Holocaust? And, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And and, and um, so, of course, that's outside science, except for Mengele. Mm. <laughs> but it, but um, it, it's, um, it gives you an idea of the lack of both depth and breadth. Hmm. Okay, so you're you're taking it back about ten years, and I think the next generation science standards were adopted in ninety three. Is that no, no, two thousand thirteen. Two thousand, yeah, two thousand thirteen. So that's about ten years. Um, so that's your you and this group are making the claim that next generation science standards are at least part of the cause of what you're seeing in your classrooms and, and tell us what do you like what are the pieces of next generation science standards that you have found to be problematic because prior to our conversation and, and just so folks know how we got connected uh, if you know anything that uh, if you've heard of the coddling movie the coddling in the american mind which was written by jonathan Haidt and greg lukianoff great book Lots of things that we rely on for our objective pluralism work, and uh, both of them have been on the podcast, and now there is a documentary that is well worth watching called The Coddling Movie, and you and I connected through there, so um, as we were talking about the Next Generation Science Standards, and I said, you know, my, my interpretation of NGSS has always been pretty positive. Um, mainly because it le leans, or as far as I'm aware of, and I wasn't a science teacher, but it leans pretty heavily into the idea of inquiry. Um, so with all of that said, you know, like what are the things about NGSS that you have found to be at least mildly uh, problematic? So um, the it, N NGSS science standards introduced equity into the, the the philosophy of the standards and to introduce equity they seem to make the decision to lower the content so the teachers have no impetus to learn the content and the students have no chance to learn the content from the teachers so um the real terrible thing is there's not a, not enough content to truly get kids engaged 
And um, I talked to a number of um, scientists in Ithaca who have kids in the school system, and their kids hate science, uh, particularly in the K through eight range. And the parents are kind of devastated about that. And um, this is the um, range where they have inquiry-based learning. And from the conversation you and I had, um, I want to be clear that um, I don't want to put down inquiry mm -hmm. um, or learning or yes. inquiry-based learning. But I do want to say that if it's inquiry-based learning with a not, not enough content, mm -hmm. Um, it's damaging. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a conversation about um, certain words like inquiry or skills or critical that usually stop the conversation. Hmm. So um, I, I want to just make a point for, I, I know there's no problem with you and me, but in general, let's just get past um, what words may, certain words may mean. Mm -hmm and talk about what's really important. And we'll see that the single word, we may have two different meanings for the word without, um, yeah. but shared meanings of what we want to accomplish. So um, I was talking to my friend Lawrence, and today actually happens to be his birthday, um, about inquiry-based learning and, and um, how I was against it. But after talking to you, I realized I don't want to, um, paint with such a broad brush. I want to say that I'm against inquiry-based learning if there's not enough content. Right. And we talked about an example that one of my neighbors gave me, and she said her son was given an apple and, and said, told to cut it in half, and it turns brown, and asked why it turns and make um, tell the teacher why does it turn brown, and the kid said, I don't know. And teacher said, make a, a hypothesis, which made it science. Hmm. And uh, he said, well, a hypothesis is an educated guest. His mother's a scientist. And, and um, he said, I'm not educated. I don't know. And that's where it ended. And the kid came home frustrated. So I was telling this to Lawrence. And he said, okay, you know, you cut the apple and it turns brown. What should the, the teacher then goes, you know why? because there's this invisible chemical in the air known as oxygen. And that apple actually gets oxidized, and that's what causes it to turn brown. Oh, is that the same oxygen we breathe? Yeah. And actually, we could do an experiment. We could remove the oxygen from the apple and see if it turns brown or not. Or you know how some apples turn brown really fast and some almost never turn brown? There's something in that apple that prevents it from browning. And Albert St. Georgie wanted to um, figure out something about Add Addison's disease, which causes some gland, I can't remember, to turn brown. And um, so we figured there's not, not much difference between cabbages and kings and Cabbages are cheaper to work on than kings. So he just decided to study browning in plants. And he found that plants had a chemical um, that delayed browning if that plant had that chemical. And that chemical turned out to be vitamin C, hmm. as we know it. So um, St. Georgie actually isolated the chemical. He knew it was a sugar, but didn't know anything else. So he submitted this evidence of this thing that prevented browning or oxidation to the journal. And he called the chemical ignos, os for sugar and ig, ig because he was ignorant about any other property <laughs> about it. The, the editor of the journal, Hardin, said, you can't call it ignos. And St. George said, okay, you're right, let's call it godnos. And uh, Hardin named it hexuronic acid because it had six carbons. And um, it turned out it, that same chemical prevented scurvy or had antiscorbutic acid, antiscorbutic activity. So they named it ascorbic acid. So there's just so many places, if you know a certain amount of content mm -hmm. that has to do with browning or oxidation and things like that, you can 
talk about the age spots on on somebody's on a kid's grandparents maybe skin mm. um become brown and what aging and oxidation are evolved together so there's just a lot of things a lot of places you can go with inquiry based learning but you have to have the content mm -hmm. knowledge in order to make it interesting so for any given student you really could take it in many directions mm -hmm. Well, there's several threads there that um, I don't think we can pull on all of them. Um, we were at, we, as you and I have talked, you know, off mic or off recording or whatever you want to call it, um, the ways in which people use that broad brush with inquiry, I think sometimes is a valid criticism. The things that you're mentioning, I think are a very valid criticism. I talk about it quite a bit. Uh, I was actually just working with a group of school leaders to set up some work for project-based learning. And we were actually talking about that. Do we, when do we use inquiry? When should we not? When should we identify what, what could be called surface knowledge or surface learning, those kinds of things, uh, content pieces, and use explicit or direct instruction to teach those things in, in, in the context of an inquiry process, which could be a larger thing, but also can be you know, sort of more granular, um, and really making sure that, that teachers do that um, if they're using inquiry and engaging students in what might be called inquiry-based learning. Um, and so there is a, there, I think, a valid criticism there. Um, I'm curious how you make that, draw that that line to next generation science standards. Um, I wouldn't have done that without. Um, but, well, I just, I just wouldn't have done that. I haven't looked at them deeply enough. Um, so I'm curious to hear how you all think about that in, you know, from the Franklin standards pers uh, perspective. Uh, but then also, just as a sort of side note, thinking about one of the things that you're alluding to, which I think is true, is people say, well, you can't ask great questions about something you know very little about, or at least you're very unlikely to ask great questions. Uh, you might get lucky. But the sort of process of setting a scene and then asking maybe surface questions that then get better questions and dig and dig and dig. So like I can imagine just off the top of my head, you know, setting several different kinds of apples out and watching, you know, looking at the different brownness of them, which would ask, which would beg the question of why is that one, not that one, which could then get you to, now that's not very efficient and I don't want to get us bogged down in that conversation. I've had, I have that conversation in lots of, of, of podcasts, maybe too many, but that is something that I think does hold value but we do want to recognize it's not necessarily efficient. So um, all of that to say, um, I'm curious, kind of get back to that question. How do you, how have you drawn that line between next generation science standards and not including the knowledge, the requisite knowledge that then shows up in your classroom? Uh, um, two things about the next generation science standards that, um, The content is so. Um, the content is limited compared to the Franklin standards. Okay. And um, as you get to older grades, the emphasis is on evolution and climate change. And if you go to the National Association of Science Teachers or the National um, Science the National. Um, science education i can't remember the um, name of the organization but if you go to evolution or climate change basically um the answer is there is no question um any questions are political everybody agrees on what's happening now science should be a way of figuring things out mm -hmm. um a method for figuring things out for getting evidence and nothing is ever s settled um sort of in principle but you can approach that settledness um by presenting evidence and argument and um people agreeing with evidence and argument instead of just shutting them off because they're too afraid to mm -hmm. buck the, um, the consensus or the authority um so the um we have this 
content, lo low content inquiry in the beginning. And then we have believe consensus and, and um, authority at the end. Hmm. And it really is still low content, mm -hmm. but, but it, it, it doesn't encourage you to be thinking about things or experimenting about things. Mm -hmm. It says these are settled. These are two issues that are settled. The Franklin standards don't, it doesn't treat anything as settled. Although it gives, um, the standards are written in a very linear, clear way where you can, um, I think in a very fair way, follow the evidence to make your own conclusion or accept a common conclusion. So let's touch a, go ahead and just touch a third rail here. And I was having this conversation with somebody uh, just in this last week, um, somebody who isn't a teacher, isn't an educator. And I was trying to explain some of this because again, we're, work, we're working with schools on what we call objective pluralism, which is a lot of this enlightenment liberalism, right? The epistemic uh, humility and the process by which we find what is true, which is always provisional, which is why we have to continue to hear more voices and questions and criticisms because without that, then we can still believe the, the earth is flat, for example. So how would how, I, I would say that it is accepted scientific consensus at this point that there are two biological sexes, not anything more than that, which is different from gender. And there's many different aspects of gender that, um, that are much more complex and complicated. But there are people who would push back and say, no, there are more, it's more complicated than that. There are more than two sexes, there's intersex, and you know, there, there are animals that change sex and all these kinds of things, right? Uh, to which I would say we have, a, we have a general consensus that is provisional, as everything should be. And, but most people, through the scientific process, would agree that there are two sexes, male and female, that it is a binary there are other perspectives and people's opinions, and I think people many times confuse perspectives with sort of truths, right? Uh, so how might somebody using the Franklin Standards approach that to make sure that, to the extent that, that they need to or should, uh, include those different perspectives or thoughts or ideas, opinions that of people who would disagree with that accepted science. So, um, in terms of science alone, and science isn't the only thing in the world. Um, in terms of science alone, sex, um, sex, the function of sex, sex is basically to to propagate the species. Mm -hmm. And if there was, there weren't two sexes. Um, we couldn't propagate the species. Mm -hmm. um, and if propagating the species is a very important aspect of living, then um, we might want to take binary sex seriously. Mm -hmm. And then we can look at um, anything from the size of the gametes or the secondary sexual um, characteristics and talk about how those things function and why they may maybe make sense in terms of two separate sexes. Mm -hmm. We can also look at the development of each, I'm going to say separate sex now, and say that um, just like this forks and spoons, if I ask you, would you pass me a spoon? I'm pretty sure you'll pass me a spoon and not a fork. Mm -hmm. But the fact that there's sporks <laughs> may make you say, well, wait a minute, you're kind of silverwareist to <laughs> say that there's forks and spoons. And really, it's just all one big happy family. <laughs> and uh, so I can give you the one on the left or the right. Which one do you want? And um, apparently, I wouldn't be on the left, so I'll take the one on the right. <laughs> so, so, um, so there's some scientific reason 
that we can say there's two sexes. However, development is very complicated. So we all essentially begin with female physiology and then anatomy, um, and then the production of testosterone, or in general, mm -hmm. changes that. And it changes it if you have a Y chromosome. Now the gene, the SRY gene the, um, on the chromosome that's gonna put maleness into action can sometimes get switched over to an X chromosome. So, so you could have somebody with two X chromosomes that actually develops completely into a male, except they have two X chromosomes. Okay, so um, you can't say, you know, they're total cis male. There's some kind of intersex there. Or you could be a male and you're producing testosterone, but you don't have the gene that produces a receptor for the testosterone. So in essence, your body is blind to that testosterone. So you don't develop the secondary characteristics and you appear like a woman, even though you have XY chromosomes and you're producing testosterone. So there's, um, so in terms of males and females, there aren't only forks and spoons. But the number of sporks is not that great. And I've seen different numbers, and I'm not quite sure what's accurate. Say maybe one in 5,000 to one in 50,000 or something. I really don't know. Um, and of course, if I ever met anybody, and perhaps I have, that are intersexual and have um, other problems that I don't have to dealing with the society, mm -hmm. I would like do as much as I could mm -hmm. to make that person um, fit in as best as possible. I mean, that, that's um, so I wouldn't disregard that the person wasn't completely cis that or this or that. But um, so there are, really are bio. So when you, in, in nature mocks our categories, but we need the categories and just like we need language and words to speak and to communicate. Mm -hmm. But um, there, there's very few things that are either black or white. But just because there's some gray doesn't mean the black and white don't exist. And I think the Franklin Standards talks about the two sexers in terms of reproduction in a way that's very believable, very understandable, and very true. But it also gives you an idea of science that have a little humility and, um, and a little charity and see that what you think may not be 100% true. So then imagining that in a, let's say, high school science class where somebody might, a, a student might say to a teacher who presents the accepted science that, you know, an abbreviated version of what you just said, uh, or maybe an expanded version of what you just said, explanation there, but a student who might say, well, there are more than two sexes, sex isn't binary, that kind of thing. How, to the extent that you're comfortable answering this question, because I know you're, you're teaching undergrads and not high school science, but what, what kind of approach or response or uh, what would you suggest or does the Franklin Standards maybe um, allude to as far as a response for, for a student who might push that, that uh, different perspective? We don't have anything specifically to answer that question. Um, I would say because it was the National, Associ National mm -hmm. Association of Scholars that um, I think everybody, our committee basically, really, truly was non-political, non-partisan. I couldn't tell you who anybody voted for, mm -hmm. for example. Unlike our faculty meeting where um, <laughs> Joe walks in and first thing says horrible things about this candidate. <laughs> um, so um, it was really non-political, non-partisan. Um, so 
given that um, National Association of Scholars and Freedom in Education, I'd say we all have a huge commitment to the sanctity of each individual and the respect of each individual. Um, the respect doesn't necessarily mean that that individual can claim what is science or not. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's Fauci's job. <laughs> um, uh, but there can be a conversation. So start the fact that we're all individuals, we're all fallible, and we're all um, want to make each other's life as, as good as we can, and let's have a conversation. Mm -hmm. So biologically speaking, um, for example, to, I'd say I see you as a male, and this is why I see these mm -hmm. characteristics. Now, you may not identify as a male. You may think you were born in the wrong body, and you may identify as uh, a female and want to go swimming um, against Riley Gaines. And I say, okay, so you have any every right in the world to identify anything you want. I mean, you can identify as sure. a chicken. Sure. Um, however, um, in a society, um, the definitions are going to matter in certain places. So, for example, um, boys are different than men. Girls are different than women. There's different rules for boys and girls and men and women. So for adults over the age of 18, um, I believe that personally, that if they want to have a biological medical sex change, do it. If that's what, um, if they were born in the wrong body. Because I guess there's one in 50,000 chance that they actually were born in the wrong body by the different hormone changes and, and all that. But I think when somebody's younger than that, either um, before puberty or going through puberty, before puberty, they just don't have the knowledge of mm -hmm. the consequences and uh, how big a decision this would be. Mm -hmm. In puberty, there's just too many waves going on within each person where they're trying out different things that um, maybe should only be temporary tryouts and not permanent tryouts. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's like, so adult, do what you want. Before that, um, I have, in terms of psychological development, I don't want anybody to say, it doesn't matter. Everybody gets to choose what body you want. And then when it comes to competing in sports, because if somebody um, is born and develops with, with more testosterone than the other, they have different bones, different muscles, different lung capacity, and it's not fair to compete in women's sports. So there's a fairness issue too. Mm -hmm. So... Um, those are the things that um, that um, I want to put biology first in those arguments. Mm -hmm. um, but a after you're 18, you're, you're um, fine to, to do what you want to do. Yeah. Well, you know, we're working with schools to help them craft some policy statements and then think about how, in this K-12, to think about how to navigate lots of this and it's a tricky thing right we're talking about enlightenment liberalism and lots of the dynamics that for example the coddling movie and coddling the american mind identify of sort of us versus them being one of those great untruths and fragility uh, that you know things that are that uh, are challenging are likely to hurt you and uh, you know, that you should always trust your emotions. Those are the three great untruths. And one of those that I think is really relevant here, especially is the us versus them, you know, good, the world is made up of good and evil people. There is, as, as we think about how we help schools navigate this, it is, I think, important to say, again, this is the accepted truth. 
uh, that we have, and I don't know that truth is the, the word I would use, but you know, what we have come to understand as being true, always provisional, but that there are different perspectives, and that it's interesting to have that that people do have pers- different perspectives, and also let's acknowledge the importance of of even if those people are wrong or we could say disagree with accepted consensus that that those those perspectives and allowing for those perspectives to the extent that it that it's feasible logistically because you know the finite amount of time and space in a in a course but as we determine what's the you know the epistemology of things what is actually quote unquote true that is th- those differing perspectives are absolutely vital and the line of demarcation that I think is important here is the acceptance or underst- and or understanding of Enlightenment liberalism versus those things that are not Enlightenment liberalism. And that's where, uh, you know, I'm looking at the NAS.org and talks about next generation science standards. Uh, combines misguided pedagogical theory, and we've kind of touched on that, right? The inquiry uh, without knowledge and how much of a problem that is. Low academic standards, and then politicized instruction and training and activism. And that's where we're we're drifting away from the epistemology, the the things that I see as foundational pieces to a working and successful democracy, which increasingly seems at risk and unsuccessful and <laughs> working less, right? Um, and and I'm, my concern is that we see that shift away or rejection of Enlightenment liberalism, both on the left and the right. It certainly shows up in schools more from the left in content and curriculum, for a number of reasons that we we can we can identify, but most people would would recognize. But we're also starting to see a push from the post liberal right to say we should have school K twelve school be this and this and this and you know oftentimes sort of a Christian nationalist perspective, uh, that kind of thing. So um, I'm not sure I even have a question there. I'm just curious, you know, what 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 are your thoughts and how do you think about those dynamics? Uh, Cornell obviously is no stranger to some of the uh, post-liberal or illiberal authoritarian uh, protests and things like that. Yeah, I, um, I think the most important thing is is to actually start with the Declaration of Independence that we're all created in God's image and have the right to life, or the Bible there, light. We're down with our creator with a, uh, well, shoot, I can't believe I'm not quoting this. Uh, <laughs> Available rights to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Okay. So um, start with, with that, um, that, that basis that each of us matters and um and each of us can have we have the liberty to have different opinions Mm -hmm. and the first amendment says we have that liberty to um practice it in religion or we have that liberty to speak what we want to say um and if I respect you to begin with, and you respect me, and I say, this is my viewpoint, and we can together try to actually learn from each other, because usually somebody doesn't have all the right answers, and a conversation um, can actually move some, where if you think the conversation is to learn and not to win, mm-hmm. and if um, you just don't from the beginning think that if somebody says a word the whole thing's going to fall apart because right. they're transphobic or racist or uh, what progressive or whatever the uh, right. name is going to be so um i would say for the teachers to be able to stimulate that kind of conversation mm-hmm. is actually more important than what the lesson plan is and i say this with a little bit of reservation because accountability matters Mm -hmm. and all that but um we need remedial 
even more than we need remedial learning of um, the core concepts of education, we need to remedial learning of how to talk to each other mm -hmm. so we can learn. And, and um, so I, I would um, emphasize, let's be, let's be able to discuss this. So this person, um, don't call me transphobic or I won't call you transphobic or any of those things. Let's just see what we want to teach each other. Mm -hmm. and, and and start with that. And, you know, um, Barry Weiss has this great article out, The Era of the Noble Lie. Mm -hmm. And um, the next generation standards are actually the era of the noble lies of evolution and climate change. Hmm. And, and uh, if you ask me. And, and um, we have just so many noble lies that whether people know it or not, the, the ones that know it says we're just not going to keep, we're going to keep our mouths shut. Mm. Just had a long two hour discussion with my department chair about every third real thing that he knows <laughs> enough to. He came to talk to me because, as he told me um, years ago, don't write anything down. Well, I do. And, uh, <laughs> you know, don't, don't, um, that people are just looking to pick you off. And um, I don't worry about that. I just don't worry about that mm -hmm. so um, try to get students to feel comfortable getting to know each other and and realizing that the most boring world that there would ever be is having everybody just like that person right and um, to appreciate the true diversity whatever the diversity is that um, that other people have to offer you so you're not confined to living in the most boring world possible and um, and just understanding through that. So I ask, um, when it comes to climate change, I always ask people, um, how do they know how the equation was derived, that the change in the log of the, the CO2 concentration times a constant equals the change in temperature. So you have this lambda in there that, so if it was zero, there'd be no effect of CO2 on climate change, on the temperature. If it was 100, one molecule you breathe out and will burn up and and people don't know what it is and i um so i ask everybody how it was derived because that if that that's the foundation of the whole climate change thing and nobody knows um and i think okay maybe i'm doing you a favor by pointing out like what the next great Thing in research would be so we can all come to agreement either with you or not um so a lot of these questions are really just um questions that would would point to what's the research that should be done mm -hmm. scientifically speaking to answer better some of these questions and um and the whole idea of doing research actually i think develops character and build it so this is true inquiry based learning right mm -hmm. oh there's a question and let's f figure out what we can do to solve it um maybe a high school student can't do some experiments on this or maybe they can figure out some experiments they could do um to understand issues like um transgender mm -hmm. maybe survey social science kind of uh, research that will give um the biologist may be something to test. Um, okay, let's um, measure um, various hormones or something in people and see if we see, can give you, yes, there's a biological reality to saying that sex isn't binary. We can show you something that you haven't figured out yet. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe somebody will do that research. Maybe they'll join in the research. Right, right. Well, there's a, a set of, of principles that we talk about or commitments and or, you know, rules. Um, of course, Jonathan Rauch's work in Constitution of Knowledge is, is found, um, foundational there, that fallibilism, right, that no one gets the final say uh, and that no one has the personal authority. Um, the, the commitments, uh, fallibilism, objectivity, exclusivity, uh, disconfirmation, accountability, I won't go through all of them, but the there's a couple things there that I think is, is really 
worth emphasizing. One, which is the importance of the inquiry process, which is it must in our in our teaching it must demonstrate and include those principles of fallibilism and empiricism um, and and so we we have to do it well and it strikes me as really odd and this is just a, an editorial on my my part here because i have these conversations with lots of folks and it tends to be in the k-12 space the more sort of right-leaning conservative folks will really rail against inquiry teaching and learning. It's not exactly a hard and fast rule, but I see a lot of it. You know, sort of classical educators who say we have to have knowledge and I say yes, but that's necessary but not sufficient. Um, my Part of my argument is, is that we have for decades not engaged in good inquiry teaching and learning uh, may, maybe more so been beholden to accountability standards and answers, however shallow or deep, probably more shallow than deep. And we have now decades of, of students who have turned into adults who are unable to have the kinds of conversations where we may disagree. And add to that the sort of activist pressures from illiberal groups, uh, you know, you can say they're sort of rooted in Marxism, critical theory, those kinds of things, which at least in some of the the sort of foundations are hostile, resistant to Enlightenment liberal principles. There's there's no if, and, or but about that. Um, you know, again, it's a spectrum. It depends on who you're talking to. Certainly some folks who are critical theory um, uh, you know, sympathetic, who are also n- not resistant to Enlightenment liberalism, but just in sort of the foundational pieces. And so what we have now is a, a, a culture that has seemed seemingly fully bought into this us versus them dynamic and just has a, a lack of understanding of what Enlightenment liberal principles are. And my estimation is that, yes, we need good civics, we need to establish norms of communication, uh, all those kinds of things, but we have to educate our population in ways that are consistent with Enlightenment liberalism because that's what our democracy is founded upon. Uh, however successful or not, and inquiry is a vital, vital part of that. And to exclude that, to say, nope, we got to get these kids to just build knowledge, and I know that's not what you're saying, and we've had this conversation, but it's just um, technically, you know, the technical term I find is it's just bonkers. Like, <laughs> you know, certainly we have to have that. So I'll agree with you. Actually, the Franklin Standards... All right, so let me go back to the third rail. Um, in high school, students want to know about the third rail. Mm-hmm. So it's important to talk about third rail topics in um, in high school. But K through 9 or 10, if we teach them how to discuss differences that aren't third rail. So, for example, if they do an experiment and we have this, all through the Franklin standards. So so they do experiment to show something. And probably the experiment will have some good aspects and some not so good aspects. And maybe it's a 60-40 crapshoot about what you might conclude from the experiment. Mm -hmm. But you could have, say, two groups, I mean, the different students choose, yes, this shows A, or no, it doesn't show A, or it shows B. Mm -hmm. And... um, and we emphasize respectful discussion for every mm-hmm. uh, at every grade, bringing up, um, doing things that don't trigger kids. Is it, so it really teaches how to turn inquiry into discussion, mm-hmm. and then how to maybe um, settle that discussion by bringing in content. Um, mm-hmm. that 
the standards are rich with and maybe some things are unsettleable and you have to wait to third grade um <laughs> when you're gonna learn some more or what a cliffhanger yeah yeah <laughs> so so i i think um k through 12 is ex exactly the place to bit by bit bring up how to um discuss things mm -hmm. how, how to how to how to turn enlightenment philosophy for measuring the size of plants you know growing after one week yeah into how do you discuss transgender issues in high school right right yeah no i get that um well i'm mindful of time but i do i'm curious how have the franklin standards been received because i had not heard of them until our interactions and uh i'm wonder i i'm not I'm not sure how many people have heard of them. So they were released a month ago. Okay. And um, I'm not privy to what's going on in the different states, mm -hmm. but there um, people are um, bringing them to the different states. And um, I know there's some kind of interest, but I don't have mm -hmm. um, specifics right right how has it been received among your colleagues my colleagues at, at cornell yeah yeah i hate to say it but cornell's not interested in teaching hmm. i mean seriously i um i i like I, said, I just had um i just um when i actually told my department chair that i was going to be the project director of that mm -hmm. um I forget exactly what he, he said, you're really going to be in the cat seat. That's what, and um, it's like, you know, something that he wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole hmm. um, because there's a lot of politics involved with it. But I think um, having discussions like this mm -hmm. um, that try to, um, I mean, I think we, went a long way to, to talk about the importance of inquiry and content mm -hmm. today and how one or the other isn't good. I mentioned in the beginning that my education didn't bash the curiosity out of me. Right. Um, but I think that's a real problem with education today. And um, I um, people I know from this area that have... Um, classical education um actually happen to be really great so i don't think they've had their their curiosity knocked out of them either from um i i, I think when they're homeschooled perhaps um they still have time to do curiosity driven things because you don't have a teacher that's looking after 20 mm -hmm. kids at once mm -hmm. um so so i i think that, um like the classical conversations work for homeschooling without bashing out the um, the curiosity, but I think when it comes to public schools, um, bringing making sure that curiosity isn't killed, and that's from having really hands-on mm -hmm. inquiry at an age-appropriate level each time. Sure. That the ex expectations are only slightly above where they are, and the teacher has enough content knowledge mm -hmm. to. Um, make things happen. Actually, I can't wait till this fall um, when it's apple season. We live in apple country up here and to cut a bunch of apples in half and <laughs> <laughs> see how they, uh, how they brown and make predictions. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, just a, a, a footnote on the classical education, you know, I, I think it's a misnote. <laughs> I mean, to the idea that classical education doesn't include inquiry and really, honestly, this is a dynamic uh, that I that I think is present. It's that sort of us versus them. I I keep trying to find the intersections and the common ground between folks who are science of learning, direct explicit instruction, and the more sort of progressive uh, inquiry constructivist kinds of approaches. And in those conversations, I think that there is significant common ground. And the idea that classical education doesn't include inquiry, I think, is totally false. 
But what these folks, because it's this sort of us versus them line of demarcation, popular front, whatever you want to call it, they feel like they have to either say bad things about inquiry, they say inquiry is bad for kids, or not ever talk about the the value of inquiry because that's what the other side values. So, well, we can't talk about that, right? I mean, we say that in politics. We see that in the culture wars kind of thing. Uh, But, you know, it's like privately or, you know, if they were talking amongst themselves, of course they're talking about how inquiry is important. Um, So that's one of those dynamics that I think is just really halting the conversation and to be able to recognize, which is a you know a humility piece here, to be critical of your own quote unquote side and say, well, they criticize inquiry teaching because one of the things they say is that it's you know you're not supposed to teach and your, your kids aren't really they don't really need knowledge they can just Google everything. That's a valid criticism. So you have to take those criticisms on, and when we do, I think that 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 gives some some credibility. And also kind of makes me think about how do you how can you be sort of an iconoclast and whether it's you that you know, sort of project manager for Franklin Standards or things that are third rail ish, I have found that if you don't come across as sort of a, a tribalist, that you're much less likely to be canceled or something like that, right? People are generally except the, the, the real activists, generally more accepting of differing opinions if they tend to, if, if they get the sense that you're not particularly tribalist, at least in my experience. I don't know if you've experienced any of that. Uh, you know, um, I don't consider, consider myself a tribalist. And, um, and, nor do I. I. People that um, don't know me are very quick to add a label. Yeah. And um, But it turns out, I believe, that anybody I can have a conversation with, we end up with a very productive conversation where we both learn. Mm-hmm. And um, although, let me say, at Cor- Cornell, um, there's a huge culture of of conformity and compliance Mm -hmm. and everybody knows that so anybody that pretty much walks away from a conversation with me even though they might have learned that something (laughs) they've really learned as my department chair says don't write anything down (laughs) to just keep it to yourself until uh that they're waiting for the pendulum to swing back yeah and Hmm. well um Lots more that we could talk about, but like I said, uh, mindful of time. Are there things that uh, that you wanted to say that you wanted to to mention or talk about that we haven't before we sign off and uh, give links or anything like that? Yeah, I want to say that um, that when I presented the um, Franklin Standards and I talked down inquiry based learning, um, I, I want to um, just qualify that that. I didn't mean that um, because I hadn't yet talked to you. <laughs> that that I, I wanted to um, put down inquiry-based learning that doesn't have sufficient content. And and I do as well. Yeah. So so that's um, we, we we don't want to um, we we're not on different sides of that word. Right. Right. Yeah. We, we learned, um, and I just I just. Um, I want to say I, I don't want anybody to come away thinking I'm against right, inquiry-based right. learning that has sufficient content. Yeah, well, you know, just uh, that was the connection, and and thank you for for saying that because I responded to a piece that was republished of yours. I think it was republished or it was published at least in the the Substack for the Codling movie, and it was at least somewhat. Um, critical of inquiry learning, as you're mentioning, and I said, "Well, wait a minute. I, I take it take exception to that," um, which opened up this great conversation and and previous ones as well. So that's the the exact evidence that we're talking about of how you think. Well, maybe this person has something to to add, and my responsibility in that 
initial content is to not say, well, you're stupid and or, you know, some version of that, right? To, to come at it with some, uh, some grace and humility as well, which sometimes is, is harder than, harder to do than others. But, uh, uh, but it is, it is, you know, this is an example of that. So, uh, again, I appreciate the piece that you put on the coddling movie and I'll, I'll try to, um, put a link to that as well. Thank um, you. Folks should definitely uh, check out the Coddling movie and check out the Franklin Stand. Great movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, check out Randy, what did you say, Randy's Wayne's World? Randy's, Randy Wayne's World. Randy Wayne's World, right? Uh, his name is Randy Wayne. He's a professor at uh, the esteemed Cornell University where everything is hunky-dory. And uh, <laughs> I appreciate the time, Randy. Uh, thank you, Drew. It was great talking with you. Thanks for doing this. What we need to do is spend enough time together that we can start to translate our ideas into each other's language and include one another in this community of inquiry. And that is the work of love.